بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وآله الطاهرين بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم فإذا نقر في الناقور فإذا نقر في الناقور فذلك يوم إذن يوم عسير على الكافرين غير يسير ذرني ومن خلقت وحيدا وجعلت له مالا ممدودا وبنين شهودا ومهدت له تمهيدا ثم يطمع أن أزيد We reached that second part of this surah, Surah Al-Muddathir. The second part, the first part was about those etiquettes that we spoke about. And it was said that there was a gap between the revelation of that first section of this surah and the verses onwards after surah verse 8. 8 and onwards are the second part of this surah that were revealed later unto the Prophet. It starts with, فَإِذَا نُقِرَ فِي النَّاقُورِ When that trumpet is blown into, the Day of Judgment comes, that I spoke about that this trumpet is for those people who are in the barzakh. This is for taking the life of the people in the barzakh. The people have already died, everyone. There's not even one person who, alive on the face of the earth. Everyone has left this world. They're all in the barzakh. The naqur is blown into. The trumpet is blown into. And now everyone has been, has lost their life in the barzakh even. The Qur'an goes on to say that that day is going to be a hard day. The essence of it is, is one of hardship. ذَلِكَ يَوْمَ إِذِنْ يَوْمٌ عَسِيرٌ That's a hard day. The next verse says, عَلَى الْكَافِرِينَ غَيْرُ يَسِيرٌ It is not easy on the kuffar. Okay, this is a, there's a question that comes up here. If it's, not, if, it's an, if it's a hard day, the verse is saying there will be a day that is hard. Does it need to tell us again it's going to be hard on the non-Muslim, on the kuffar, excuse me, not non-Muslims, kuffar. What's the difference between غَيْرُ yasir, not easy, and hard? Well, outside, if there's something happening that is hard, is it's not easy. Same thing, right? But there's a little bit of a difference in theory. Sometimes something is hard and there's no ease in it at all. Sometimes something is hard, but there's a little bit of ease in it as well. Relatively hard. It's not, it's not completely hard. What does this verse exactly mean when it says, it will not be easy for the kuffar? The verse before was saying it's going to be hard. Why is it saying this? Is it repeating itself? Is it trying to exclude Everyone except the kuffar from the hardship. That means it's only hard for the kuffar. What is it trying to say here? Three possibilities we have here to understand this verse. Number one. Is that the verse is just saying, listen, I'm just going to tell you about the kuffar. I'm not going to talk about others. Only for kuffar, I'm going to say it's going to be hard. What about other people? I'm silent about it. It might be hard. It might be easy. It's not clear. We don't know. The verse doesn't disclose anything about it. Yes, عَلَى الْكَافِرِينَ غَيْرُ يَسِيرٌ It won't be easy for kuffar. For others it might be easy, it might not be easy. But this interpretation can't be right because the previous verse said it in an absolute fashion. It said it's hard in essence. I don't even care about the people. The day itself is a hard day. Whether there is somebody, there is nobody. Yes, the next verse is talking about the kuffar in specific. It's trying to say something else apparently. But even if it wasn't there, that first verse, verse number 8 or 9 was it, will be applying to everybody anyway because the, 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 the day itself is a hard day. In essence, whether you're tall, whether you're short, whether you're African-American, you're white, you're dark-skinned, you're light-skinned, you're mu'min, you're not mu'min, it's saying it will be hard in essence. That means no matter who you are, what you've done, it's a day that's hard itself. So the next verse is probably adding something. Okay, what is it adding? It can't be this first possibility then. 
Number two interpretation, which I like more. These now, these are tafsirs that I've, this is my own tafsir actually kind of, yani my own possibilities that I think, I don't think I've seen this anywhere. These next two uh, possibilities. Number one, that the day is a hard day for everyone unless you're one of those exceptions. We'll talk about the exceptions in the future. It's a hard day in essence, but there will be exceptions. Meaning what? Meaning for some people it won't be hard. Question that will come up here is that you just said that this day is hard in essence. That means no matter who you are, it's going to be hard for you because this itself is a hard thing. The answer is that that it will be relatively hard. Yes, it's a hard day in essence. But if you make an exception, that means for some there will be ease in it. For some it will be easy. Let me give you an example and then inshallah you'll get it better. There's, there's these super strong people out there that can lift weights of, I don't know, 300 pounds the guy will lift for you. 400 pounds he'll lift. Is 400 pounds something light? No, it's something hard. It's heavy. So he can, this person is picking up something heavy. Just because he can pick it up, does it mean that it's not heavy anymore? If I try to pick it up, can I pick it up? No, it's not, it's something heavy. For him, it's light. For him, it's light. Just because he can pick it up doesn't mean it's not something heavy anymore. This person is also heavy. This person is also strong. That's why he can pick it up. Just because he can pick it up doesn't make it something that's not heavy anymore. The day of judgment is a day that's hard. It's heavy. But some people are so strong, they, their iman is so high, they are connected to Allah so well, that this hardship won't apply to them. Does that mean it's, it's not a hard day anymore? No, it's still a hard day. That weight was, is still heavy, but he can pick it up. So it's heavy, but at the same time, it's easy for him. That day is a hard day, but it's an easy day for those who an exception is made for them because they're so strong. They're so up there. They are even, in some accounts, they are beyond Yawmul Akhira type thing. What do I mean? Just hinting at this. They are so high and so connected with Allah. In a way, they have become one with Allah. In a way, that the Qur'an, when it says we are rolling up the scrolls, this earth is like a scroll, this universe, we're rolling it up on the Day of Judgment. They're not even in there to be rolled up with it. They're beyond it. This is not only ma'asumin, brothers and sisters, there's more, it's more. Man, insan can reach that point through obedience of Allah. If anything else was necessary other than obedience, the Qur'an would let us know. But the Qur'an is just talking about obedience, 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 that's all. Giving us stories about how shaitan was kicked out just because he was disobedient. If we continue the obedience of Allah, we reach a point, inshallah, inshallah, that we won't even be affected by the hardship because we're so strong, we're even beyond the hardship of this Yawm al Qiyamah. So, yes, it's a hard day in essence for those people who are not immune to its hardship. But those people who are immune to it will not have any trouble. This is another interpretation of the verse. We'll talk about the exceptions, inshallah. Number three, number three interpretation of this verse, you can say is that when it says it's hard and for the kuffar it's, it's not going to be easy, that means it's hard, there's no ease for the kuffar in it at all, but for others, although there's hardship in it, but there's also ease in it. I hope you get the point. If there's something, if there's a mix of ease and hardship, can you call it all hardship? No, there's some ease in there too. The verse is saying, it's going to have hardship. Now, will it have ease in it too or not? It won't have any ease in it for the kuffar. 
But for others, it might, there might be ease in it too. Some might experience some hardship as we have in the hadith. Some people in the dunya, Allah gives them hardship so that some of the bad that they have done, that they have not repented for, is forgiven. Some people, their death is hard. Have you noticed some mu'mineen might have hard deaths? Painful deaths maybe. It might be because Allah wants to cleanse them. He doesn't want them to have any hardship in the barzakh. Some people, it's not enough. The barzakh has to give them a little bit of hardship. Some people, yawmul qiyamah might experience hardship. But there will also be ease. For some, there will be no ease at all. And that's what the verse says. The verse says, Ala al-kafirin. The kuffar. They saw the truth, but they were still turning away from it. They were still enemies of Allah. For them, it will be a hard day. Will there be ease in it too though? No, there will be no ease. غَيْرُ yasir. You won't find any yusr in it. There won't be yasir in any way. Not even 1%. Out of these three, personally, personally, although I'm, not, I'm nothing, I'm inclined towards the second possibility. <clears throat> that this is a day of hardship, but... There's, some, there's an exception. Some will not taste the hardship at all. And the reason why I personally am inclined towards this, and if you've noticed, this is the first time I actually am speaking like this, that this is my choice, because I didn't find this in the tafasir. I, this is just my, my own three possibilities that I gave. It's just something I thought about. But the second one I feel has the best proof, best evidence in our sources in the ahadith, in Qur'an even, that it's a day that there will be hardship, but there are some that will not taste any of this hardship. Not that there will be ease and hardship for some, and for some there will only be hardship. No, no, for some there will be no hardship at all, not even one split second. Let me give you an example of this. Very hope-inspiring, very hope-inspiring. <clears throat> First, I'm going to take away all hope from us, then I'm going to give us hope, inshallah. So one of those verses that I recited the first night that, I, that we were talking about, or the second night, we were talking about how you can't understand all of what is meant by the Qur'an through the translation. One of those verses was in Minkum, Surah Maryam. وَإِن مِنْكُمْ إِلَّا وَارِدُهَا كَانَ عَلَىٰ رَبِّكَ حَتْمًا مَقْضِيًّا All of you, there will be none of you except that he or she will be a warid of Jahannam, the hellfire. Warid of Jahannam. What does warid mean? <clears throat> Warada in Farsi means that warid should means he went into something, entered something. So if someone was reading this verse and they're Iranian, when they see this verse, they'll think that it says, oh, all of you will enter the hellfire. But that's not what it means in Arabic. In Arabic, warada means to get very close to something, as to border on something. When you get real close to something, you have warada it. Okay? In minkum illa wariduha. All of you will be taken close to the hellfire. Whoa! We had heard that when you get even, you, it's so bad. Hellfire is so bad that you can't even see it. It's not something that can be, that one can bear. But the verse is saying we're going to take you close to it. That means we'll feel the heat at least. Unless all of the stuff we've heard was false all our lives. That the hellfire is like this, the hellfire is like that. And of course it's not like that. The Quran is talking about the hellfire. How the blaze of the hellfire is. And how it burns. So we're being taken close to the hellfire. We can't even get close to normal fire, let alone the health fire. So conclusion is that we will all at least feel a little bit of hardship. We will feel that usr. Based on this verse, this is what it's implying, right? Then someone might say, but we've all, we, we, we know that the muttaqeen, those who are obedient, they will, they will never have had sense any hardship. Why do you say that? Because muttaqeen are, the Qur'an promises they will never ever feel huzan, grief, and khawf, fear. When you're taken close to the hellfire, you'll feel fear. 
you will be grievous at what you see. It's hot. Who says that the muttaqin will never feel any hardship? The Quran says. Where does it say it? We have two verses. I want you to put them together. I want you to follow with me. It's like math, okay? It's like A plus B. A equals B. B equals C. So A equals C. It's something like that. It goes like this. We have two verses in the Quran. Number one. أَلَا إِنَّ أَوْلِيَاءَ اللَّهِ لَا خَوْفٌ عَلَيْهِمْ وَلَا هُمْ يَحْزَنُونَ The awliya Allah are the ones who will never experience khawf and they will never experience huzn. It's all good on that side. No trouble at all. Whatsoever. Awliya Allah. Okay, so awliya Allah equals no grief and no huzn. And no khawf, no fear. Okay, so that's our A equals B part. Awliya Allah equals no fear and no grief. Who are Awliya Allah now? I know A equals B. What does B equal? Who are Awliya Allah? Awliya Allah, the Quran says somewhere else that my Awliya are only one group. In Awliya'uhu. They are not his awliya except in awliya'uhu illa al-muttaqoon. My awliya, Allah's awliya, if you want to be waliyullah, the chosen one of Allah, the close one of Allah, the one who has the authority of Allah. The verse doesn't say my, my chosen ones are the muttaqoon. It says only and only are the muttaqoon. Those who are my obedient servants. If you want to be awliya Allah, you have to be obedient servant of Allah. You have to be muttaqoon. So, conclusion. Awliya Allah will never experience fear or grief. Awliya Allah are muttaqoon. Conclusion. Muttaqoon will never experience fear or grief. That's the conclusion. A equals C. So the Qur'an itself is telling us that if you're an obedient servant of Allah, you will not have any problem on the other side. But this verse said that we're going to be taken close to the hellfire. The next verse says in Surah Maryam, Then we will rescue, then we will save the muttaqoon, those who had taqwa. Okay, this doesn't read with Qur'an. The other verse, that I, the other A equals C that I just mentioned. One is saying, Muttaqoon will never have that. This verse is saying, then, after we take them close, show them, maybe they will burn a little bit because they're very close. After that, thumma, we will rescue them. So how do we fix the problem? Fixing the problem lies in a hadith that I will mention to you, and we probably have more than one hadith, but I like this one that I will mention to you. Hadith goes like this. That on the day of judgment, the mu'mineen, the muttaqeen, what will happen is they will be in Jannah, in paradise, and then they'll remember this verse. And they'll say, didn't our Lord promise us that He's going to take us close to the hellfire? The Quran says, in minkum illa wariduha, thumma nunajjil ladhina taqaw. We're going to be taken close. What happened? I don't remember. Where were... Then they will, be, they will be told that you did go close to the hellfire. You were taken close to the hellfire, but the hellfire began to complain. It said, take this mu'min away from me. Make him pass the bridge of the sirat quickly because he's extinguishing my fire and my blaze. That means this person is so strong that the fire has no effect. It's hadith. More than one hadith, from what I remember. That the fire is a burning entity, a burning thing, but it doesn't burn him because he's so strong, he's immune. So, lil kafirina ghayru yasir is letting us know that these kuffar 
they're going to be taken to something that's very hard, one. And two, although it's very hard, and, but because they're not immune to it, they will be affected by it. In other words, the غير kuffar, those who are not kuffar, it will be yasir on them. Although it's a hard day, but it's not going to be hard on them. For them, it will be yasir. It will be easy. Inshallah, we're of those types. Recite this salawat. So if we ever have a question on how to be spiritual, what's the secret? There is no secret. The secret is these verses that I just recited. An obedient servant of Allah, yes, an obedient servant of Allah has to know how to be obedient. That means he has to know all the wajibs, all the harams. It's not just about fasting. It's not just about prayer. That's part of it, yes. The social aspect is also there. How I am in the family and at home is also there. What I do when I'm alone is also there. Everything, everything. The more obedience, the more immunity. The less obedience, the less immunity. It just depends on how much I respect myself. Moving on. Next verse. ذَرْنِي وَمَنْ خَلَقْتُ وَحِيدًا Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, now he sounds upset. He's talking about a particular person. Now it's cool, if Allah talks about a particular person in the Qur'an, that's pretty cool actually, to have your name mentioned in the Qur'an. But you don't want your name to be mentioned in the Qur'an in a bad way. تَبَّتْ يَدَىٰ أَبِي لَهَبٍ وَتَبْ Allah talks about Abu Lahab. He's so famous now. Everyone, since the advent of Islam, till today is cursing Abu Lahab, and the Qur'an, and the Malaika, and everyone is cursing him. So it's not always good to be famous. It's good to be famous in a good way. It's good to be famous in a way that when you pass away from this world, when, you, when we die, the heavens and the earth, they cry over, the, over us. There's a verse in the Qur'an that talks about how, I think it's about Fir'aun, if I remember correctly, because I'm just saying this off of the top of my head right now. Fir'aun and his army, when they died, Allah speaks of them in a bad way. He says, man, these guys, I'm just paraphrasing here. Look, they wasted their lives. They wasted everything, their existence. فَمَا بَكَتْ عَلَيْهِمُ السَّمَاءُ وَالْأَرْضِ if, if I remember correctly. The heavens, the earth, didn't cry over them when they left this world. There's a hadith that when a mu'min passes away, the sama, the ard, they weep over this mu'min that has left this life. We want to be of this type. When we leave this world, not only do our close ones, but the, the heavens, the earth, the angels, everyone. It's good to be famous like this. But Abu Lahab is famous in another way. Let's get to know another loser that was, that's also famous in the Qur'an. Of course, the Qur'an doesn't mention him by name, but it's talking about the Mufassirin, the Tafsirs, the history, and the Sha'n al-Nuzul that, is for, that has been mentioned for this verse, say that this is about a person by the name of Walid bin Mughayra. The verse says, ذَرْنِي وَمَنْ خَلَقْتُ وَحِيدًا Leave me with that person that I've created myself, by myself. There's this one person that's really getting on the nerves of the Muslims. Leave him with me. I'm going to punish him separately. So that is that tone of Allah that we don't want to hear, inshallah, in the future. Walid bin Mughayra, who is he? He's from Bani Makhzum. Bani Makhzum are one of those branches of Quraysh. Quraysh had like 25 branches. Bani Umayyah is part of Quraysh. Bani Hashim, Quraysh. Bani Makhzum, Quraysh. 25. Some get along with them. Some don't get along with each other. Some are very wealthy. Bani Hashim was known for their, they were noble. The noble ones were Bani Hashim. It's beautiful. Bani Hashim, they go back to Hashim. Hashim was very noble. And this nobility extends in the family. Bani Makhzum, this Walid bin Mughayra is very, very wealthy. Who is he? If you want to know who he is, we all know who Khalid bin Walid is, right? Khalid bin Walid, that commander, that very brave commander of the army of the Mushrikeen, who in the battle of Uhud, we all, we've seen the movie, we've heard the stories, they went around that hill, that cliff, the, the mountain, and they um, surrounded the Muslim army from both sides. We've heard the story, right? 
that Imam Ali and a few remained on that mountain and they were, they, were, they, they were injured. Some of them were killed, if not all of them, except for Imam Ali. Alayhi salam. Now, Khalid was the one who led that army around the mountain and they surrounded and they eventually were able to defeat the, um, the Muslims. Right now, I am second, I'm second guessing. I don't know if Imam Ali was there as well or not. I, I'm mixing things up, so, so my apologies on that. Okay. Khalid bin Walid is the son of this Walid bin Mughayra. Khalid bin Walid, the Shia school has reservations regarding him. Yes, he became Muslim, I think, in the sixth year after Hijra. He was also serving the Muslims in their armies after the Prophet passed away. Also, he was in conquests and leading armies, but he has made big mistakes, very big mistakes. One of them is the story of Malik bin Nuwayra. Malik bin Nuwayra, him being one of the heads of the tribes outside of Medina, it's a long story. Long story short, Khalid bin Walid goes and kills him and does very bad things after he kills him with his family. Coming back to the story though, this is Walid bin Nuwayra, the father of Khalid bin Walid. Very wealthy and influential. How do I say that? Why do I say that? They say he had 10 agents or 10 servants who took care of his financial affairs. 10 servants. Why, do you, why, why 10? Because he had 10 qintars of wealth. What does 10 qintars of wealth mean? Back then there was no banks. So what they do? What they did was they would <clears throat> empty out the stomach of the cows and the skin of the, the cow is there. They would fill that cow with gold or silver maybe so a qintar of wealth Shahid Mutahari says this equals one cow's weight of gold right nowadays it's about Benjamins back then it was about cow's weight of worth how many cow's weights worth you got how many qintars you got he's got ten one is even a lot one is something you won't see every day how many of us see stacks of hundred dollar bills every day we don't see every day this man had 10 of them. 10, like, say, safes of $100 bills. This man has. Or it's even more. This is gold we're talking about. So each of these is being invested and worked with through one of these agents that he has. He sits back, he sits back and relaxes, take, lets others take care of business. Very wealthy. If you're very wealthy, that means you're very influential. Not only does he have wealth, he has many sons. Today, the less you have, the better. Back then, the more kids you had, the better. Things change a lot. For the worse sometimes. So many sons, and the Quran talks about this, we'll get to the verses. How he had lots of wealth, and he has lots of sons. And to add to all of this, he's a merchant. Since he's a merchant, he's always traveling. And when you travel, you see lands, you see people, you get in touch with people, you see what's going on. You're illiterate, you're not illiterate. Back then, merchants were some of the most learned people in the sense that they're seeing different cultures. Other people, they're just farmers or they're into agriculture. They don't, they don't get a chance. They can't leave their farms. They leave their farms, everything will rot, everything will go bad. So this is all of this he has, plus he's a poet. He's an expert in poetry. He can tell good poetry from bad poetry. So look at that. He's got the whole package. Very influential. He's great. And that's why we have a verse in the Quran, Surah Zukhraf, verse 31, that some say is talking about him. That the people will tell the Prophet, Oh Prophet, why didn't the Quran come down on one of those two great people of the two great places? Ta'if which is one of the cities, and another city, Mecca. These two cities had two big people. The great person in Mecca was Walid bin Mughayra. In Ta'if, another person by the name of Urwa. Urwa bin Mas'ud, I think. Yes, at taqafi Some people would say, if, if this Qur'an is so great, why was it not sent upon someone great in this sense? He's a poet. He's, he's got all those cultures, he's merchant, all that wealth, sons, everything. He's got everything. فَلَوْلَا قَالُوا لَوْلَا نُزِّلَ هَذَا الْقُرْآنَ عَلَىٰ رَجُلٍ مِنَ الْقَرْيَتَيْنِ عَظِيمٍ Why was it not set down unto someone great 
if this Quran is great. They don't know that. This is not what brings greatness. Okay. This is the person that we're talking about here. The Quran is talking about. Verni, leave me with this man. I have beef and problems with this guy. Why? What has he done? What's so bad about him? Let's talk about how the, the Prophet would call people to the Islam in the beginning and then see what this person's reaction was and what he did wrong so then we can know why Allah is so upset with him. The Prophet, when he wanted to invite people to Islam, he wouldn't go and start coming with philosophy and saying, you know what? There's this concept of wajib al-wujud and there's this concept of mumkin al-wujud. Mumkin al-wujud in its quiddity and wetness does not have wujud and existence. So this existence must have, come, must have come somewhere else. And it will have to end with someone that existence belongs to him in essence or else this will be a chain and an infinite regress. How much of an effect did I have on you right now? Except that you're thinking if he's going to continue like this, he should just come down right now. The Prophet would go next to the Kaaba, number one. The Kaaba itself, Adama, greatness. History is there. Everyone has respect for the Kaaba. That's one. Number two, the Prophet himself is a great personality. Everyone is in love with Muhammad. Sallallahu alayhi wa So that's two great things. And then number three is that he is reciting verses of the Qur'an that are also great, that people are mesmerized by. They are, it's as if they're intoxicated by it. They just go dizzy. It's interesting how they say that some of these great these spiritual wayfarers in their private circles, and when I say greats, I mean the real greats, not the ones who act like greats. Not the ones who think they have to even dress like greats, but there's nothing great about them. No, greats that were really greats. And they were, had private circles because not everyone was fit for those circles. Some of these people, when they would leave that, those, those gatherings, it's as if they were dizzy from what was said and what had been given to them in there. Anyway, let's come back. This is how the Qur'an was when the Prophet was recited during the, next to the Kaaba. So, if you want to touch someone, you don't necessarily have to do it philosophically. I'm not saying that that's bad or anything, or we shouldn't go into those areas. Yes, we have to also have theology. We have to be ready, armed, intellectually, so that when the shubuhat and the challenges that are out there, they're, they're presented to misguide us, we have answers, for sure. But if you want to bring people towards Islam, you have to touch their hearts, I'm sorry. I looked into this kind of, or I've been paying attention to this, to this for a long time now. Whenever there's an account of a person who reverts, they say, they say, say revert. So when they revert to Islam, when you look into their stories, usually it's not because this person took courses on Islamic theology. It's because this person opened up the Quran and had someone explain the Quran to them. The last story that I have is one of these brothers that now he's come to Qom actually. And he was telling me how a person he had become interested in Islam and I was like okay how'd you what would you do to interest to give them interest in Islam he said nothing I just translated surah qul huwa allahu ahad it's beautiful Allah knows how to do it why do we think we gotta do it another way that's why these lectures right now they're all tafsir of Quran to show us that how beautiful the Quran is just we have to like it's more than just translation though <clears throat> If you want to touch the people, it not necessarily be intellectually, although that's also very, very important. As a matter of fact, let me say this, this is funny. Um, in Qom, we've had Christian theologians come who know Islamic theology. Not only do they know Islamic theology, they know Al-Hikmah Al-Muta'aliyah, transcend, transcendent philosophy and wisdom of the school of Mullah Sadra, for example, the great philosopher. They know it maybe better than me. He's a Christian Catholic theologian. And I'm blown away at how good he knows it, but he's still Catholic and Christian. It's about touching the hearts. Ta'leeful qulub, bringing the hearts together. Ta'alaw ila kalimatin sawa. Come, let's come together regarding one word that we all agree on. Let's bring the hearts close. That I, I personally believe Quran is where it starts. 
Okay. So now the Quraysh, they're being defeated. The idol worshippers, they're being defeated. They're losing business. The Prophet is capitalizing on the Kaaba. One, his personality. Two, three, the Quran. Three great things. What do they have? They got nothing. When a miracle comes, you can't fight the miracle. There's no way except for sub but submission. So what do they do? They're angry. They have to come up with a way out. They go to Walid. They come to Walid. They say, Walid, he's ruling the hearts of the people. Walid right there should have said, there's nothing I can do about it. It's interesting how Imam Al-Qadim alayhi salatu was salam And once again, I'm just relying on my memory here. The Khalifa of his time, he says, what are you doing? Like, how, how do you do it? What's going on? You, everyone is in love with you. He says, because you rule the bodies of the people. We rule the hearts of the people. People rule, rule the hearts. Big stuff happens. You can't get in the way of it. They come to Walid. They say, Walid, help us out. What do we do with this guy? I mean, come on. Walid says, you know what? Let me see what he has to say. Walid is smart. He doesn't say, okay, we got to do this, we got to do that. Walid says, let me go see what he has to say first. So Walid goes. Walid goes and listens. He listens, and all of a sudden he runs away. Why? Because he was also being affected by the Qur'an. He was being drawn towards it. He got scared. Because when you get drawn to the Qur'an and you want to embrace the Qur'an's message, you're going to have to give up a lot of the stuff that you're doing. You're going to have to give up a lot of wealth. It's unfortunate sometimes people reach the conclusion that they have to embrace Islam, but they don't. Because, I don't know, for example, drinking is haram in Islam. Alcohol is haram in Islam. As a matter of fact, even during the Prophet's time, one of those influential individuals, he had reached the conclusion that Islam, he has to follow the Prophet. They said, become Muslim. He says, no, I want khamr. I still want to be able to drink khamr, wine. And he continued, let me get as much as I can out of this wine, of this dunya, then I'll become Muslim. Ajal didn't give him, not al-ajal, but ajal. Okay? Al-ajal means to hurry, to hasten. Ajal means fate, means death here. Didn't give him that opportunity. He went on and on drinking, but eventually he died before he could become Muslim. We seek refuge in Allah from Su'ul Aqibah. Anyway, <clears throat> this man sees that there's truth here. Not only is there truth, it's pulling me towards it. I better run because I'm going to have to give up a lot of stuff. Lots of my wealth is haram. I'm going to have to give that up. Lots of things that I do is haram. I'm going to have to give... I'm going to run. He runs for his life. He goes home for two or three days. He doesn't come out. That's how much he's affected. To the extent that they say, Saba Walid. Walid, Walid Saba. Saba with a sad means that you fall in love with something. They're like, this guy also fell in love. That's the word they would use back then when someone would fall in love with the message of the Prophet. When they were just like drawn. You see how... Some of these bugs are drawn towards that light. But when they reach the light, boom, they explode. The light was there to draw them. They can't even think anymore. This is it's something like this. The Prophet would draw them. They said, this man also Saba. He's, we lost him. What happens? His nephew gets angry. Who's his nephew? I said, Walid bin Mughayra was from Bani Makhzum tribe. His nephew is Abu Jahl al-Makhzumi. Abu Jahl, that great enemy of Islam, who was killed in the battle of Badr, he's the nephew of Walid bin Mughayra. He comes and says, uncle, what's going on? We sent you to fix the problem, you messed it up more? This is how you fix it? Walid says, no, 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 don't worry, I'm smarter than you. I haven't humiliated you, I haven't embarrassed you, I'm thinking of what to do, because we're stuck here, we got a problem here. I was even being drawn towards him. I ran away because I was afraid of being drawn to the Prophet. Look at that, brothers and sisters. He is, he is, he is admitting that he, there is a truth there, but I'm still not going to accept it. And the Qur'an talks about this, about how there are many people out there that know the truth, but they don't accept it. Surah Naml, verse 14. They impugned them. They turned away from them. They rejected the truth. Why? While they were convinced in their hearts. Why? Wrongfully and defiantly. Hulu. They were after Hulu. They're after that takabbur again. They want to be up there. They don't want to lose what they have. Wajahadu biha wastaykanatha and fusahum. 
they had conviction, they knew it was the truth, but they still turned away. This is one of those examples. The reason I'm saying this is because in the future, when we talk about how Allah is going to burn him, I want us to know that those who will be burned in hellfire have to have done something very bad. They have to be like Walid bin Mughayra type. We want to give hope, not false hope, true hope, but the hope is there. I'm going to talk about that. So if you know the truth, you turn your back on it, that's when you are responsible. Okay. What's the problem now, Walid? What, what, why, what, why are you putting so much thought into this? He says, because you're calling him contradictory names. You're calling him a liar, one. You're calling him a poet. You're calling him insane. You're calling him a soothsayer, a sorcerer, a magician. Where in the world do you find all of these in one person? He's insane, but he's a poet. He's insane, but he's a sorcerer. He's insane, he can tell you, he can, he's a fortune teller. How can you be insane and do all of that? You are contradicting yourselves. It shows that you are desperate. You're stuck. That's why anything you can think of, you're saying it. This is actually helping him. And as a matter of fact, brothers and sisters, that's why Shaheed Mutahiri says this. Credit's got to go where it's due. Shaheed Mutahiri, rahmatullah alayhi, recite salawat for his soul. Think who his teacher was, Allah Taala. He recited salawat for his soul. I take honor in mentioning these names. Shaykh Matari, he says that's why even the Quran keeps talking about these things. He, he keeps mentioning these names that they would call him. Sometimes when someone's attacking you with words. You won't tell those words to others so that other enemies can also use those. Teach them the way to fight you. Right? You won't show them that. So these are excuses to not follow the Prophet. He's insane, he's a poet, he's a sorcerer. The Quran is saying these on purpose to show how desperate they were. You see how beautiful it is? Alright, so what should we call him? Walid, what should we call him? Walid says, you know, the closest thing I think out of all of these, if you're gonna, you know, if this is multiple choice, I'm gonna choose magician or sorcerer. Don't call him a poet, insane, oh, put those away. Call him a sorcerer, magician. Why? He does magic on the minds through these words that he says that he calls Quran. Let's call him a magician. Let's just stick with that. Let's all be on the same page, all of us bad guys. All right. But the Quran here gets very. It starts painting a picture for us. It doesn't say it the way I say it. It goes like this. It goes, "Darni waman khalaktu wahida, wajaltu lahu malan mamduda." I gave him lots of abundant wealth. I gave him. Wabanina shuhuda and children living in in presence. They were there. They're, they're there with him. He has sons. Mahatu lahu tamhida. I gave him everything. Whose life I have made run smoothly. Some people you just feel like, man, this guy is so successful. Why is the successful person always not me? Still he wants war from me, this person, Walid bin Mughayra. Kalla innahu kana li ayatina anida. He was hostile to our verses, to our signs. سَأُرْهِقُهُ Sauda. We shall make him suffer the torment of hell without relief. Why? What's wrong? This is what happened. He didn't just say, you know what, do this. Call him a sorcerer from now on. That's not what he said. What did he say? He said, now this is the Qur'an. The Qur'an is getting very explicit here, very detailed. إِنَّهُ فَكَّرَ وَقَدَّرَ He sat down, he thought, he measured things out, weighed things out. How should we do this? فَقُتِلَ كَيْفَ قَدَّرَ May he be dead the way he measured things. ثُمَّ قُتِلَ كَيْفَ قَدَّرَ Again, may he be dead. May he die the way he did measured things. How bad he measured things. So he sat down, he thought. ثُمَّ نَظَرَ He looked around, he's thinking, he's still thinking. ثُمَّ عَبَسَ وَبَصَرَ He frowned and scowled. and You know when you're thinking too hard, your eyebrows go in, you look like you're frowning and stuff. So they're sitting there discussing stuff. All these verses are just talking about how he was thinking. And then it says, 
ثم أدبر واستكبر. So he's like, should we do this? Should we not do this? Kind of like Umar bin Sa'd لعنتullah عليه where he was given the option of Ray or killing Imam al Hussein alayhi salam. He chose Ray instead of Imam al Hussein, but he had to think about it all night before he made the decision. He's going back and forth, but now he comes out. Thumma adbara wastakbar. He turned back. This uh, Walid bin Mughayra. He didn't even look at the people. It says he turned like this and he kind of looked. He's like, with pride, he says, This is what you're going to do. فَقَالْ إِنْ هَذَا إِلَّا سِحْرٌ يُؤْثَرٌ We're going to call it sorcery. Not only are we going to call it sorcery, not only are we going to call it magic, سِحْرٌ يُؤْثَرٌ سِحْر magic that is passed on. He was taught. Someone taught him how to do this. Now, I don't know if Walid bin Mughayra had studied theology, but he's making a huge theological point here. So, hats off to him on this point. This is not magic, just magic. I'm going to make sure that people know that this is magic that was handed down. Why? What's the point I want to make here? When you go to Islamic theology, when you reach that point where prophets have no choice but to present a miracle to prove their claim of prophethood. If this person was really sent by God, and we want to make sure that he was sent by God, God has to send him with a miracle, or else anyone can make a claim of prophethood. The only way you can prove someone being a liar when they say I'm a prophet is to ask them, where's your miracle? Okay. So miracles are something that Allah gives. Is it something that can be taught? They will tell you no. One of the conditions of something, of a phenomenon, being a miracle is that it cannot be taught. Or else if it can be taught, that means it didn't come from God. It came from who? From Bashar, from a normal person. Magic is something that is taught. Magic is something that is handed down. Can a miracle be handed down? It can be handed down. It can't be taught. So he's saying, let the people know. This man was smart, man. He's saying, make sure the people know that this is magic, one, but make sure you put your finger on the fact that it was handed down to him. That way, there's no way it can be a miracle. So for us, this shows that, look, when the enemies of Islam, 1400 years ago, know their stuff, that means we better know our stuff. How to prove this wrong. But eventually, this person is... If he still can't, if he he still failed, of course. But the point being here is that look at how Allah is angry at this person. Because فَكَّرَ وَقَدَّرْ He sat down, he thought. He knew the truth, but went against it. The point is that you have to know the truth and go against it. Sometimes people are against the truth, but they don't know it's the truth. Necessarily there, it won't have the saqar as a punishment. Allah here is letting us know that, listen, if you sit down and think, you come to the conclusion that this is the truth and you turn away from it, that's when satar is for you. Not necessarily all non-Muslims will have satar. We have to see in the Quran, does it say that or not? What is for sure though, brothers and sisters, now that we know the truth, we better be very careful. Because if we know the truth and we still mess up 100%, we will be held or we can be held responsible for it. Inshallah, Allah gives us the tawfiq to keep that in mind, one, to learn about it and to act upon it, inshallah. Walhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. Salaam ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad.